following is from my book, The True Irish Ghost Stories by Mark Rains. Chapter 1 Haunted Houses in or near Dublin. Of all the species of ghostly phenomena that are commonly known as haunted houses, appeals most to the ordinary person. There is a, something very eerie being shut up within four walls of a house with a ghost. Poor human being placed under such disadvantage. It be known that the gateway or a road or a field has a reputation of being haunted. You can nearly every case make a detour and so avoid the unpleasant locality. But the presence of a ghost in a house creates a very different state of affairs. It appears and disappears its own sweet will with total disregard of our feelings. It seems to be much part and parcel of our demoiselle as the staircase or hall door. Consequently, nothing short of leaving the house or pulling it down, both these conditions, solutions, not always practical, will feel free us absolutely from the unknown welcome presence. It also is something so natural at the same time as so unnatural is seeing doors open. We know that there's no human hand rests on the knob or hearing the sound of footsteps Light or heavy feeling cannot be attributed to feet of mortal man or woman. Perhaps a form appears, a room, standing, sitting or walking. In fact, situated in its three dimensional dimensions, apparently, as an ordinary being of flesh and blood. And so it proves its unnatural, of its unearthly nature by vanishing before our astonished eyes. Or perhaps we are asleep in bed. The room is shrouded in darkness. A cumbered multitude, together with a weight of thread clothes, hampers our movement and probably, probably makes us more recalling. Man will meet pain or bodily danger bodily, for he is standing upright, occupying the erect position, while it is his lord or creation. But his courage does not wail so high, for he is sublime, supine. He awakens suddenly by the feel that some superhuman presence is in the room which transfixes the terror. We cannot find us either the bell rope or the matches, or we dare not leap out of bed and make a rush for the door. At least we shall encounter. We know not what. In ag- agony of fear, we feel it moving towards us. It approaches closer, we get closer to the bed. For what matter why or what may not have happened, we must refer our readers to this page of this book. A sceptical reader would say this is all very well, but there are no haunted houses. All these alleged strange happenings are due to vivid imagination, else to rats and mice. Christian deliberate and conscious fraud may be rejected in almost every instance. A simple solution has been put forward. So often it would seem infallible, have solved the problem long ago. But will such a reader Explain how it is that a noise made by rats and mice resembles slow, heavy footsteps, or else take the form of a human being seen by several persons, or how our imagination can cause doors to be opened and shut, or else create a congregation of noises which physically could be beyond power of ordinary individuals to reproduce. Whatever may be the ultimate explanation, we feel there is a great deal the words quoted by Professor Barnett. In spite of all reasonable circumstances, it's difficult to avoid accepting, at least provisionally, the conclusion that there are certain sense haunted houses, i.e. there are houses in which similar crazy human apparitions occurred at same at different times, different inhabitants, and so this was exclude the hypothesis, suggestion, expectation. We now turn to the subject of this chapter, Miss J G. Kelly, and one lady well known in musical circles in Dublin, bears her own personal experiences. The following tale, the most quite haunting, in which the spectacle, spectacle chair lady was not seen, did not, does not seem to be entirely laid aside or main day habits. My first account of a ghost occurred about twenty years ago. On that occasion, I was standing in the kitchen, my own, my own house in Square. The woman, whom I was afterwards seen many times, walked down the stairs into the room. I heard the footsteps outside. I was out 
I was not at least perturbed, but turned to look who it was. I found myself looking at a tall, stout, early woman wearing a bonnet and old-fashioned fantail. She had grey hair, a benign, admirable expression. We stood gazing at each other while one could count twenty. At first, I was not at all frightened, but gradually, as I stood looking at her uncomfortable feeling, increasing the terror came over me. This is me caused me to retreat further and further back, till I had my back against the wall, then her apparition slowly faded. His feeling of terror drew perhaps her unsatisfactoriness of her appearance, always overcame me on the subsequent occasions which I saw her. The occasions numbered tw- 12 to 15. I have seen her in every room in the house, every hour of the day, during a period of about 10 years. Last time she appeared, she was 10 years ago, as and I just returned from a concert at which he had been singing. We sat for some time with the supper, talking about the events of the evening. At last I rose to leave the room, opened the dining room door, found my old lady standing on the mat, outside with her head bent towards the door, in the attitude of listening, called out loudly, with my, and my husband rushed to my side. It was the last time I had seen her. One peculiarity of this spectral visitation, with a large, strong objection disorder or dullness of any kind, or even an alteration in the general routine of the house. For instance, he showed a disapproval of any strangers coming to sleep and turning chairs face downwards on the floor in a room they were to occupy. I well remember one of our guests having gone to his room one evening for something he had forgotten, marking and coming downstairs again. Well, you people have an extraordinary manner of arranging your furniture. I nearly broke my bone. Or over one of those bedroom chairs. Which were turned down the floor. My husband and I restored the chair twice already with proper position during the day. We were not so much surprised that it was marked so. He did not lighten him. I found him disturbed by a peculiar knocking which occurred to various rooms in the house. Figuring the door or the wall, the side of his furniture, quite close to where that we had been sitting. It was eventually loud enough to be heard in the next house for our next door neighbour once of my husband, while he set his such curious hours of hanging his pictures. Now a strange and fairly frequent occurrence was following. I had a set of skunk furs that fancied it had an unpleasant odour, as the furs sometimes has, and at night I used to take it for my wardrobe and lay it on a chair in the dining room, which was next to my bedroom. First time I did this, I go into the drawing room, drawing room, found my surprise my muff, so uncalled and stole in another. Not for a moment suspecting a supernatural agent. I asked myself about it. She assured me she had not been in the room for that morning. Whereupon I determined to test the matter, which I did by putting the furs late at night. Taking it in, I was the first to enter the home in the morning. I eventually found they were, that they had been disturbed. The following strange and pathetic incident occurred a well known squire on the north side of the city. In or about a hundred years ago, a young officer of the order to Dublin took a house where there for himself and family, except for his wife and two children, intended to join him, of course, for a few days. Well, after the nurse arrived, he found an old, only an old chair lady, chair lady in the house. He left shortly after arrival. Finding that something was needed, the nurse went out to purchase it. On her return, she asked the mother where the children were right, as she'd seen two gushy fools it passed them on the doorstep. Never answered that she believed they were. By going up to the nursery, she found both the children with their throats cut. Murder never brought to justice. No motives ever discovered a crime. Unfortunately, mother went mad, said that the only feeling still clings to the house. The two little heads sometimes seen in the window, a room where a deed was committed. A most weird experience happened to Major McGregory. Contributed to him, by him to the real ghost stories, the Saturday Christmas number review of reviews. He says, in the end of 1871, I went over to Ireland to visit my very relative living square, north side of Dublin. In January 1972, the husband, my relative, fell ill, ill, sat up with him for several nights at last. He had been better. I went to bed and directed the footman to call me. If anything went wrong, I soon fell asleep. But some time after he's wakened, I pushed one by pushing the left shoulder and stood up and then 
there's anything wrong? Abba said, is there anything wrong? I've got no answer. Major received another push. I've got nine and said, can you get speak, man? Tell me where this thing, is there anything wrong? The other answer had a feeling I was going to get another push. I suddenly turned around and caught the human hand. Whoa, the pump and soft. I said, who are you? I got no answer. I tried to pull a person towards me, but I could not do so. Then I said, what I do do, I know who you are. I said the hand, having the hand tight in my hand. With my left eye, I felt the wrist and the arm enclosed, it seemed to me, in a tight fitted sleeve of some winter material, a linen cuff. But when I got to the elbow, all trace of the arm ceased. I was down, I was down and let the hand go, and just as the clock struck two, including the mistress of the house, the five females establishment, sure, I was assured the hand belonged to none of them. I pulled it to the adventure, so it was claimed, oh, it must have been the mince masters. Oh, Betty, who lived for many years in the upper part of the house. He died over fifty years before great age. I afterwards heard the room which I felt the hand considered haunted. Very close noises and peculiar instances occurred, such as clothes, bedclothes torn off, etc. One lady had a slap in the mouth face with some invisible hand which she had felt lit her cradle candle. She saw as if something complete fell to the fell or jumped off the bed. To an officer, her lady, brother of her lady, sat there two nights, but throwing going to a hotel, raining the third night. The others would say what he heard or saw. Always said the room was going to canny. Sat for months in that room offers, and never felt the least disturbed. A truly terrifying night was witnessed by a clergyman in a schoolhouse of many, good many years ago. His cleric was a curate of the Danish Dublin parish, resided with his parents some distance away out of town and direction of Marmot Manalay hide. Not doing quite what he happened, he had had to hold meetings in the evenings and on such occasions that his house was so far away that the modern convenience of Tranquers was not known. He was known to sleep in the schoolroom, a large bare room where meetings were held. He made a sleeping apartment for himself by placing the pole across one end of the room, which he rigged two curtains, which, which was even drawn together, met in the middle. One night he'd been holding some meeting, and everybody left, he locked up the empty schoolhouse and went to bed. A bright moonlight night. Every object had been seen publicly clearly. Scarcely had he got into bed when he became conscious of some invisible presence. He saw the curtains agitated at one end, as his hands were grasping them. On the outside, in an agony of terror, he watched his hands groping alongside, outside the curtains, till they reached the middle. Curtains were then drawn a little apart, face peered in. Lawful, evil, eerie face, evil face, based on wickedness, hate upon it, which no words could describe. He looked him at, to him at few moments, and drew back again. Curtains closed. The clergyman, with different courage, left to leap out the red, make a thorough examination of the room. But as he expected, he found no one. Dressing himself so quickly, he passed as possible. Walked home, never stepped from the night in that schoolroom. Following tale was sent by Mr. E. B. De Lacey, contains which strongly and saturated element of the mystery. It says when I was a boy and lived in the suburbs, I used to come in every morning to school in the city. I lay, lay for a certain street, which was which stood a very dismal, semi-detached house, which you might say closed up regularly about every six months. We would see very tenants coming into it, and then in a few months it would be let again. This went for, on for eight or nine years. I often wondered what the reason was the reason. Quarrying one day from a friend, told it was a reputation of being haunted. A few years later, I entered business in a certain office. One day, it fell upon my lot. I have a call on a lady, who in that particular period was a tenant in the office house. When we just corrected our business, she informed me that she was about to leave. The name of the house being to, to, to various of the investigation of the ghost story. I asked if she would give me the uh, history as far as she knew it. 
which he said kindly did as follows. About four years ago, the house was left by will to a gentleman named. He lived in it for a short time. He suddenly went mad and had to be put in asylum. Upon this, his agents let the house to a lady. Apparently nothing happened, usual happened for some time. A few months later, he went down one morning to a room behind the kitchen, found the hot cook hanging by rope attached to the hook and ceiling. At the inquest, the lady gave up the house. It was then the closed up closed for some year time, but again it was advertised to let. Caretaker, woman, who felt put into it. One night after one o'clock, constable doing his rounds heard someone calling for help from the house. The found the caretaker was still one of the windows, holding as best she could. Holding as best she could. She he told her, go and open the ball door, let him in. She refused to enter the room again. He forced the door open the door and succeeded in dragging the woman back in the room, only fine. She'd gone mad. Again, the house shut up. Again, it was let this type of lady of five years lease. Ever after a few months of residence, she looked it up and went away. Friends again. Oh, uh, on her friends asking her why she did so. Why she would rather pay whole five years rent and live in herself or allow anyone else to do so, but would give no reason. I believe I was the next person to take this house, said the lady. No, just sorry to me, i.e. Mr. De Lacey. It took about eight months, three months ago. I think it on about 18 months ago on a freely lease. In hopes of making money or make, taking boulders. I now give it up, up because none of them say more than a week or two. They do not give up any different reason as to why they're leaving. They are careful to state this not because they have any fault to find me and my domestic arrangements. They many say they do not like the rooms. The room themselves to clear good faces. And well lit, 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 lighted. I have all classes professional men. One of the last was a barrister. He said that they had no fault to set, find, set me. Did not like the rooms. I myself do not believe in ghosts. I have never seen anything strange here. Elsewhere, but if I know in the house, the reputation of being haunted, I have never rented it. Marsh's library, that quaint old world pharmacy of prendress tombs, proved to be haunted of ghosts. This former primate, Narcissus, Narcissus Marsh, said before great in the gallery, contains what was forming his own private library. He moves in and out among the graces, taking down books, finding them on the shelves, occasionally throwing them down, readers' desks as if in anger. Ever, he always leaves things in perfect order. A late mister, who for some years lived in the librarian's rooms, and he was a firm believer in this ghost. He said frequently, heard noises, which could only be accounted for by the presence of not to a visitor. The present tenant is more sceptical. The story goes that Marshall's niece eloped from Paris. From Paris. She married to Tavern. Tavern to a curate of the chapel that is lloyd. She appointed to have written a note consenting to an elopement to have them placed in one of her uncle's books to which her lover has access. Where he found it. As it punishment for his lack of vigilance, I was said to condemn Hunt for note until he found it. Find it. Hence the ghost. The ghost of the deceased canon was seen as in one of the D- D- Dublin cathedrals by several independent witnesses, one of whom, a lady, gives her own evidence. Experience. Experience has sat the fellow's canon, a personal friend of mine. They had many times discussed ghosts and spiritualism, which he was a profound believer, having had many supernatural experiences himself. During the Sunday morning service at the cathedral, found my, saw my friend, been dead for two years, since he signed the communion tools. I was so much astonished at the flesh and blood appearance of the figure that I took off my glasses of white linen, my handkerchief, at the same time looking away from him down the church, looking back down again, he stood there, and continued to sit there for a about ten or twelve minutes. Well, after a while, he faded away. I marked the change in personal appearance, which was his beard was longer and whiter than I have so known him. In fact, such a change would have occurred in life in the space of two years. I told my husband the occurrence of our, on my way home. He remembered having heard some talk of the appearance of this clergyman, Creed, since his death. I ran back to the afternoon uh, service. I asked Ro- Robo Rice, but he went to see him, Canon. Ghost. She told him she had. He had also been seen by one of the sections of the cathedral, 
suggest mention this because describe your first appearance. You marked the same change as I had with regard to the beard. So if you some years ago the family had some had a very uncanny experience as to Ralph Gar. Subsequently I have another Raph Raph Money Mays. They were committed, committed by one of the young ladies, Miss M. A. Wilkins. I published them in the journal American SPR, from which they are they have been, are are here taken. The Rothgar House and Basement Passage into the yard. Along this passage, her brother and children used to hear dragging, limping steps of a hatch of the door rattling, but no one could be found or such as made. The house bells were old and all in a row, and no one, one occasion, all, they all rang apparently their own accord. The lady narrator used to sleep in the back drawing room. Always when the light was put on, she heard strange noises. This someone was going round the room, throwing papers along the wall. While she often had feelings, a person was standing beside her bed. A cousin who was a, a nurse once slept with her. Also noticed strange noises. One occasion this room was given up to a very matter of fact young man to sleep in. The next morning he said the room was very strange with queer noises in it. Her mother had a strong experience in the same house. One evening, she had put, just put the baby to bed when she heard a voice calling mother. She left the bedroom and called to her daughter, who was in the lower room. What do you want? The girl replied she had not called her. Then in her turn, asked her mother, if she found in, she had been in the front room, but she had just heard a noise. This someone was trying to fasten the inside bars, such as across. Mother had been upstairs. No one was in the front room. Being Sir Rafmaini's house, a uh, slimmer oratory nature, a young lady heard the names. No, it was found that no one else had done so. Can you have that ghosts of spire, lawsuit, 17th century, they'd be found uh, actively urging the adoption, legal proceedings, but 19th to 20th centuries, they play a massive, more passive part. A case about a haunted house took place in Dublin, the year 1885, in which the ghosts may be said to one. A Mr. Walden, a solicitor's clerk, sued his next door neighbour, one Mr. Kerman, a mate of the merchant office, to cover five hundred damages done to his house. Kerman together denied the charges, but said that Walden's house twice haunted. When it is approved that every night from August 1884 to January 1885, stones are thrown the windows and doors, an extraordinary and acceptable occurrences continually took place. Miss Walden, wife of the plaintiff, swore that in one night he saw one of the panes of glass of a certain window cut through with a diamond, a white hand inserted through the hole. She once caught a billhook and aimed a blow at the hand cutting off one of the fingers. His finger could not be found, nor any trace of blood seen. The toe and hers are slowly persecuted by noises. Persecuted by noises. The, fowls, the servant hers are slowly, slowly Persecuted by noises, pers- persecuted by noises and foot- hours, footsteps. Mr. Warden, the head aide of detectives and policemen, endeavoured to find out the cause. And no success, the witnesses in the case were closely, closely examined. But without shaking the testimony, the facts appeared approved. The jury found that the covert man, the defendant, at least 20 persons to testify on earth the fact has been known as to have been haunted. For all having leaving the setting, the immediate surroundings, we must relate the story of ghosts, somewhat lucky in good manners, yet without a certain disorder sense of it. But as the incredible, though, tell me, seem, and yet it comes very good authority. Later, the informant, Mr. D, by Mrs. C, the daughter, was employed as a governess. Miss C is the guide of a woman of spiritual position, good education, heard in her turn from her father, the mother. Throwing a relationship with different persons seemed a little involved. 
It would appear the initial A belongs to the surname, both of Mrs. C's father and grandfather. Ghost is commonly known as Corn by the family. The answer to this, though, is not his proper name. He disclosed his letter to Mrs. C's mother. Have they got it? Corny made his presence to the fest to A. Family shortly after they had gone, resided in street. Following manner, Mr. A had sprained his knee badly, had to use a crutch, which at night was left at the head of the bed. One night, his wife heard someone walking on the lobby, pump, 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 as if invitating. Mr. A, who struck a match to see if the crutch had been removed, the head of the bed, they were still there. From that on, they were that on. Corny commenced to talk. He spoke every day, but from his usual habit, the coal cellar of the kitchen. He always shouted if he came out of an empty barrel. He was very troublesome, continued playing practical jokes to the servants, who he might have suspected were in terror of their lives of him, so much so that Mrs. A could hardly induce them to stay with her. He used to sleep in a press room, bed in the kitchen, in order to get away from Corny. They even asked him for a room at the top of the house, which was given to them. Corny, the best bed, was moved up there, and the last night they went to retire to bed, the father changed the doors of the press, and flung open Corny's voice said, Aha, you devils, I'm here before you. I am not confined to any particular part of this house. Corny continued tampering with the old doors, straining locks and keys. Any of has himself in the material, Form for two persons too, who died of a fright to Mr. A, Mrs. C's father, when he was about seven years old. Dad described him to his mother as a naked man with curl on his forehead, a skin like a clothes horse. One day, a servant was preparing fish for dinner. She said it in he laid it on the kitchen table as she went elsewhere for something she wanted. When she turned, the fish had disappeared. She therefore, she there, thereupon began to cry, fearing she would be accused of moving or making away of it. Next thing she heard was a voice calling from the cellar door, scroll cellar, saying, There you blundering fool, this is your fish for you. And suiting the action of the word, fish has flown out the kitchen floor. Relatives of the country used to bring presents of vegetables. They often hung up for calling, like Christmas decorations around the kitchen. In one peculiar press in the kitchen, he would not allow anything onto, into. He would throw it out again. A crock with meat and a pickle, put in it, the fish placed on the cover of the crock. He threw out the fish out. Two of the spoons were missing, on account, no account of them could got in until Mr. A., Asked Cooney to confess he'd done anything with them. He said they were under the tickling the servant's bed. He said he had to say, he, so he said, the daughter in the street sometimes announced he's going to see her, would not be there tonight. On one occasion, he announced he's going to have company that evening. If he wanted any water out of the soft water tank, the tank before going to bed, he and his friends would be using it. So, currently in the night, five or six of his voices heard. Next morning, water, the tank was black as ink. Not alone that, but bread and butter in the pantry was, was streaked with marks of sooty failures. His clergyman in locality, having heard the stoings of calling, called to investigate the matter. He advised Mr. A, Mrs. A, to keep quiet, not reveal his identity, being the best chance of learning, hearing Corny speak. He waited for a long time, capricious Corny remained silent, he left at length. So I was calling, why did you not speak? He replied, I could not speak while a good man was in the house. So sometimes I used to ask him why, uh, where he was. There's a reply, the great God will not permit, permit me to tell you. I was a bad man and died to death. He named the room in the house in which he died. Crawley constantly, tinnily, joined in any confrontation carried on by people in the house. One would never tell by the voice from the cold cellar would erupt in the dialogue. He had his likes and dislikes. He appeared to dislike anyone, not afraid of him, would not talk to them. Mr. C's mother, however, used to get good, get good of him by coaxing. Uncle, having failed to get him to speak one night, took the cold poker hammered on the door, coaxing and saying, I'll make you speak, but Corny wouldn't. His morning poker was found broken too. 
His uncle used to wear bets with Corny. He used to call him derisively four eyes. An uncle named Richard came to sleep one night. The plane in the morning. The clothes were pulled off of him. Corny told us something of great glee. I slept on Mr. Richard's freight all night. Mr. Finally, Mr. A made several attempts to disclose clothes of his police, but no success. But their intending purchases were being shown past the carried and the corny's domain. The spirit began, would begin to speak. It would be purchased and would fly. They asked him if he cha- as they changed houses. Would, tr- would he trouble them? Fly, no. But if they thrown down his house, I would trouble the stones. I asked Mr. A. Appealed to him to keep quiet. Not to injure people, never injured him. He promised he would do so, and then said, Mrs. A, you will be all right now, for I see a lady black coming on the street of this house, and she'll bite. Within half an hour, a widow called and approached the house. Possibly Mo Corny, still there for a new foreman, looking up the dictionary as he is writing, found the word Mark House, Mark Bacon. Neil Blake Blanche Card Town Co. Dublin House occupied by prison or up to near, very recently by private family. The swami and monastery was said to be, be secret practices in. Once the eye in the kitchen saw the figure when none approached the kitchen window. Looking a informant was also told by a friend, now dead, who had in going for the lady of the house. But one night once night falls, so no doors should be can be kept closed. Anyone shuts them, or is immediately flung or open again. Great violence and apparent anger. It left open, there's no trouble or noise. The light footsteps are heard. There's a vague feeling of people passing to and fro. Persons are happening in the house. A matter of fact, there are people who speak as if it were an everyday affair. So long as we leave the doors unclosed, they don't harm us. Why should we be afraid of them? Miss said truly. Most philosophical attitude to adopt. Haunted House of Kingtown Co., Dublin, was investigated by Professor W. Barrett, Professor Hedley Sedwick. The story is singly well arrested, as one might expect being interested in the pages of proceedings, SPR 3, apparitions seen in three distinct occasions by three separate persons who were all personally known as the above gentlemen. How so which is following occurrences took place to describe being a very old one with unusually thick walls. A lady saw a strange visitor, resident in her bedroom. She says, disliking cross lights, I had got into the habit of having the blind or the black window drawn and shutters closed at night. I leave them blind raised and shutters open, falls the front, liking to see the trees and sky when awakened. Opening my eyes one now one morning, I saw right before me this occurred in July 1873. A bigger woman stood me down and apparently looking at me. Her head and shoulders wrapped in a common woolen shawl. Her arms were folded. They were also wrapped as if in warmth and shawl. I looked at her in my horror. I did not cry. At least I might not have moved. An awful thing to speak or action. Before I heard, behind her head I saw the window. A glowing dawn. Lucky glass upon the toilet. A table. The furniture then in that part of the room. In that part of the room. After that may have been only seconds of the duration of this vision. Could not judge. She raised herself or went backwards towards the window. Stood at the toilet table and gradually vanished. And it means she grew by degrees transparent. And through the shell, the brave dress she wore. I saw the white muslin. Her table off again. At last saw the only in the place where she stood. Ladies lay motionless into terror. She was a servant came to call. The only other occurrence of the house at the time were a brother and a servant, to neither to whom could make any mention of circumstances. Fearing the former would laugh at her, and later, latter give a notice. Exactly a fortnight later, while I'm sitting at breakfast, he noticed her brother seemed out of salts and did not eat. On asking if anything was the matter, he answered, had a leary nightmare. Indeed, it was no nightmare. He saw it early in the morning. Just think as I saw you. What? she asked. Venus looking hag, he replied, with her head and arms wrapped in a cloak, sitting over me, looking like this. 
got up from his arms and put himself in a exact position of vision, whereupon she informed him that she herself had been had seen a fortnight previously. About four years later, the same month, Lady's married sister, two children were alone in the house. And his child, a boy about five or well, five years old, old years, asked for a drink. Mother went in to fetch it, drawing him to main the drawing room until he turned, her turn. Coming back, she met the boy pale and trembling and asking him why he left the room. He replied, who is that woman? Who is that woman? Where, she asked. That old woman went, went upstairs, he replied. So the lady was he, and she took him by the hand, went upstairs to search, but no one was to be found, though he still maintained that that woman went upstairs. A fiend, a friend of the family, so when he told them a woman had been killed in the house many years previously, reported to be haunted. You've been listening to Chapter One of True Irish Ghost Stories by Mark Rain. First published by Mark Rain and Rains, 2023. Copyright 2023 by Mark Andrew Rains. All rights preserved. No part of this publication may be recorded, reproduced, stored, or transmitted in any form or any other means. Electronic, mechanical, photocopying, recording, scannings, otherwise without written permission for the publisher. It is illegal to copy this book, post it on a website, and distribute it by any means without permission. This novel is a tiny work of fiction. Names and characters and incidents portrayed in it are work of health and imagination and resemblance of actual persons living or dead, events of localities entirely because of the instrumental. First edition, the book was professionally typeset on Red, Red Sea. Find out more on redsea.com.